Well, how about we go ahead and get started, Jonathan? So absolutely. And go and go for that. So uh, a a big 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 welcome uh, for all of you that have already joined us, and I really appreciate uh, you joining in. It's always a pleasure to share my passion with other anglers as well as uh, all those family members who are joining in on this phone call tonight. So I really appreciate that. I'm also going to kick off with Jonathan. I just want to thank you so much for agreeing to be my moderator. You know, we've volunteered a lot and worked together a lot over the last few years, and um, I couldn't have asked for a better uh, moderator. So thank you on that. So yeah, would you like well. to share a, a few words about who you are and uh, why everybody should be wowed about you? <laughs> I don't know if I'll go that far, but um, I'm Jonathan Walter. I uh, live in Denver, Colorado area. Uh, I've been teaching fly casting and fly fishing for 25 plus years now and uh, obtained my uh, FFI master level casting instructor certification in 2013 and uh, been been very glad that I did it and been working with Marianne, as she mentioned, uh, doing volunteer stuff and working together on casting instruction uh, and sharing ideas and so forth. So um, we have a great uh, group of instructors, 1400 of us worldwide. So, and now that we're doing video, the casting instruction as well, there's no good excuse for anybody who needs casting instruction not to get casting instruction. So yeah. welcome everybody, happy to be here. Yeah, yeah, so. I couldn't agree with you more. And uh, you know, like you said, we aren't the only two about promoting the art of fly casting. We've got 1,398 peers out there doing the same thing. So uh, like Jonathan, I have, uh, uh, you know, and I'll have not shame to call it, I am a casting nerd and I am very proud of my, MCI from Fly Fishers International regarding casting. And um, I have been so fortunate um, to have been able to leave the high tech world and pursue a career of being a fly fishing guide. And I think you'll see a mix of all threes of those personalities tonight. Um, so that's fantastic. Um, what I want to also start with here is you know, we've designed the content tonight. We realize that we've got a lot of different audience skill levels in fly fishing. Uh, I imagine there's a few that, you know, are just getting into fly fishing, others that have been doing it a couple years, intermediate, and those that have been doing it for a long time, advanced. And, uh, you know, uh, my guess, or my hope, I should really say, is that throughout this evening, there's a few times where you will say, wow, I know that. That's cool. There'll be another few times when you say, oh, wow, that's really cool. I never knew about that. That's like, just awesome. And then maybe for some time, someone of you might say, Marianne, what is she talking about? You know, when that happens, don't worry about it. There's a lot of information we're going to share tonight to meet all the different skill levels. All I do is ask you to sit back relax, enjoy, and soak in whatever you can soak in. So with that, I also want to talk a little bit about the, um, and I noticed we've got some chats going on. So uh, Corey, if you're hearing me, uh, you'll be managing those. And Jonathan, um, he's my, as my moderator, he's going to be keeping an eye on the Q&A. So if you have any questions as I continue with my content tonight, please put those in the Q&A and uh, Jonathan will do his best to bring those to the appropriate time in the presentation and I trust him he will because I know how observant and, and of a deep thinker he is. So I have no worries about that. And uh, what else do we need to add on? I think that's all. I think we got um, it. I think we got it. One thing, you know, a few, uh, we're going to show a little video in here and I am hoping that all of you brought uh, your rod butt with you. I also ask for you to have brought a uh, butter knife with you. So I hope you have that because um, this will be audience engagement and we learn the best by interaction. So with that, 
I'm going to kick off, talk about our goal tonight. I'm going to go ahead and share, and that goal will follow with a video. And uh, just a little comment. I get a little geeky. I know Jonathan and a few others are tired of that. But uh, the playback of this video is really going to be a function of your download capabilities. So my apologies if it's a little herky-jerky. Uh, this video is really it's really just about getting you into the ambience of our whole talk, right? Our whole talk is about a better fly cast, right? We'll get you more fish to the net or catches more fish, however you want to call the title. So with that, I'm going to start sharing my screen. I got to make sure I hit all the correct buttons. So I've got to make sure I share computer sound. I got to make sure I optimize screen sharing. This is a lot of work to do this, you know that? And I got to pick the right screen to share. And I believe we're there. Fantastic. Beautiful fish there. Nice little rainbow from the Cricket River. Um, or was it the Fall River? Oh, just too many fish. Anyway, my goal, Jonathan's goal, the goal of all of our other 1,398 cast instructors is to motivate you to improve your cast. And by doing so, you're going to catch more. That's our, that's our goal for this evening. I'm going to kick into a video. It's going to be a video for me fishing and catching, thank goodness, catching at Yamsey Ranch. Um, what I really want you to notice as I do the video is, well, you'll see, and I'll talk through it. So I'm going to kick off that video. And Jonathan, uh, please speak up if the, uh, if you will, yeah, around wanna, the volume of the video. And for those wanna, of you on the line, you might need to up your mm -hmm. volume a little bit. This doesn't have a lot of uh, human noise in the video. It was intentionally to catch the, uh, the serenity of fishing. And you were gonna say something, Jonathan? Yeah, I wanted just to point out to everybody that what this uh, video uh, represents is why it's important to have loop control and that will become clear by the end of the talk. Okay, so here we go. And for all of my great nieces and nephews um, watching, enjoy my catch. Take a few minutes to get there and here we go. Again, we're at Yamsey Ranch. It's a Spring Creek, the upper stretches of the Williamson River in Southern Oregon. Missed it. You'll notice my so you'll be able to replicate that second cast. And here we go. Fish on. Nice Gotta love that bend in that rod. That's the best feel when you're fly fishing. Is that that feel of that fish on. Woohoo! Rainbow. Yeah. Cool. Finally at a Beautiful point where fish. I can net this fish. Nice fish. You would think as a guide that I could do a better job at netting, but uh, one thing to net someone else's fish versus your, your own. So. net. And are we getting any audio Woo! on that, Jonathan? Yes, there is audio. You were a little hard good. to land there, I'm not dear. It, so that's good that you guys are. A beautiful rainbow. Not a bad rainbow for the morning. I'll take that one. I'm gonna give back quickly into the water. And I have to tell you, releasing a fish is some of my business, uh, my greatest joys in fly fishing. Cool. So now I want to stop this very quickly. So cool. I hope that well. A little bit of an audio issue. So Jonathan, if there's any questions to fill the time while I uh, fix my little technical problems, that would be cool. There we well, go. Yeah, there is one. And actually, I need to ask a question back of the person who wrote in 
hook set, dries, nymphs, specific species, cutthroat versus browns, rookies, et cetera. Is, is this, it's not clear to me from, from the uh, person submitting it, is this a question that you have that you want to talk about the hook set? Well, you know, Jonathan, I'm just going to save us there. We could do a whole seminar on the hook set, couldn't we? Yes. Right? And uh, so uh, what I would say is the hook set, man, the only way you learn the right hook set is you're going to lose fish. The good news is, as I always tell my anglers, so you miss the fish, but at least we got the fish to look at your eye, at your fly. And um, it just takes practice and an in intuition of knowing how to set that hook. So, and I don't want to get into all the different hook sets based upon your fishing tackle that we could spend 59 minutes on that, couldn't we, J Jonathan? Yeah, pretty much. Yep, yep. So great question. Let's write it down for another seminar. So, uh, or webinar, I should say. So what are we going to cover? So we're going to cover what we casters call the pickup and lay down cast. Most of your anglers will call it a back cast and a forward cast. That cast has every single component and any other cast you're going to do. So if we can master that cast, you are on a long, uh, you are on the path to catching more fish. We're going to talk about this thing around muscle memory. It's actually myelin and, and the value of practicing. And practicing means not fishing. I have the pleasure of demonstrating three drills that I've used to really improve how well I can load and unload that rod. We're going to talk about, as John, Jonathan talked about, loop control. What's the right loop size to the fishing situation? Okay? There's really never a bad loop if that was the loop you intended to cast. And uh, my recent obsession, and my peers know uh, my recent obsession, obsession uh, but the power of video analysis, the power that we can use to look at your cast in slow mode to help you take that casting to the next level. Again, it's all about getting you to, repeat after me, out there in the audience, catch more fish. So now I need to go and stop my sharing. I'm going to be moving into another video here showing uh, the pick up and lay down casts. But before I'll do that, I will do a bit of a demo. Cool. Jonathan, help me uh, position myself here. Yep. Yep. Cool. So we're going to go through the steps of the pick up and lay down cast. How many of you brought your rod butt with you? If not, step safely, even if you didn't, step safely out of your chair, grab a pen or something. The best way you're gonna build these skills is to mime with me. So we're gonna start with a pick up and lay down cast. And Jonathan, you're gonna join in. You're such a good moderator. So we're gonna put the rod tip low, right? Lines on me, lines straight out in front of me. I'm gonna do a lift. Can you see that lift? I intentionally had this white rod. Maybe I'll go right yeah, in here. You can see it. You can see it? Can okay, see it. cool. Mm -hmm. You can see it? Okay, cool. So I'm going to do a lift. That's step one. I'm going to do a accelerate to a stop. And that is, well, all of this is a continuous movement. And then I'm going to pause. I just executed, or did, sounds bad, I didn't kill it, but I just did a back cast. I'm now going to do my forward cast. How am I going to do that? I'm going to accelerate to a stop. I'm going to pause for a second. I'm going to see my loop form, and I'm going to follow that line down. Okay. I want to do that one more time, but I want to talk a little bit about what's happening, and then we'll move to that video where you guys can see this real time in slow-mo. Okay. As I lift, what's happening is my fly line is coming off the water my rod should start to bend because of the water tension on the weight of the line. As I accelerate, that rod's going to bend some more. When I stop, all that rod knows is straight. It's going to unbend, unload, unroll. I then need to stop. I need to cease movement on this hand, and I need to pause for that line to unroll. When that line is almost unrolled, 
kind of like a candy cane. I'm going to come forward for my forward cast. I'm going to do that by accelerating to a stop. And then as I see that loop form, I'm going to go down. Anything you want to add on that, John? Um, no, I thought that was great demonstration and uh, should complement the upcoming video pretty nicely. Okay, cool. So I'm going to go and do my little magic to uh, bring my uh, iPad, stream for my iPad. So hopefully technology will work for me. And uh, if it doesn't, you need to fill in the space, Jonathan. You know that, right? <laughs> okay, so yes. Technology worked. I'm going to go ahead and spotlight my video. Uh, and Jonathan, uh, you'll have to let me know. This is one hard thing about the webinars, right? We don't really see um, all of the uh, participants' comments. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and, and play this video. Yep. And again, it's me. And you'll notice I've got a green screen. That's just. Uh, um, a wow you, it's most importantly, it's to help you see the fly line. I'm going to play this at regular speed. Yeah, I know I'm doing the, the power of the video analysis now. Okay. There's a, do it one more time. I'll talk that through. So here we go. Play it one more time. There's my back cast, my forward cast, a pickup and lay down. There's my pickup. There's my lay down. Now that's kind of hard to see in real time, as we all know. So I'm just going to go ahead, because I can, play this in half speed. Hopefully you can all see that. If you notice on the, the next cast, watch for the lift. The lift? Yeah. Cool. Pretty cool stuff. So what I want to do now is show the real value of this tool, is we're going to go... Mar yes. Marianne, how much, about how much line do you have out there? Oh, I probably, from my foot to the end of the fly, given I'm working with a seven-foot uh, bamboo rod, four weight, I probably got about 30 foot of line now. Great, thanks. Yep, cool. Okay, so I'm going to go frame by frame, and we're going to talk through those steps so you can see that. So as Jonathan says, here's my lift, and if I was on water, the tension of the water and the weight of the fly line would start to make that rod bend. And here's my lift. Okay. Now you're gonna start to notice, notice my hand is now moving backwards. I'm going into my accelerate mode and you can start to see that fly line or fly rod, get my words right here, is starting to bend. Here we go, bend, bend, bend. And in a second, you're gonna see that rod go straight. That's my stop, right there's my stop. You can't see it very well, but I'll go ahead and draw on the screen. Your favorite color, Jonathan, tonight is what? Uh, yellow for this. Yellow for this, okay. If you look real closely, you can start to see that loop form and it's going to unroll behind me. Okay. There's my stop. I'm doing a little drift. That's another webinar. I'm going to come forward. Right? And as I come forward here, I'm doing my acceleration into my forward cast. Rod's going to bend again. I'm going to stop. And right here, this is roughly right there is my stop. But you're going to see that fly line now is changing direction because I sent it in a different direction. And my loop that we so love to see is unrolling right there. And we'll watch that loop unroll. And you'll notice now as that loop is unrolling, what am I doing? I'm lowering my rod tip. Cool stuff. Do you think I should and show I that again? That you're, I noticed that you're lowering the rod tip slower than the line is falling. Yeah, keyword there, we'll get there. Well, let's do that again, right? So there's the back cast, the stop, the pause, rod straight, a little bit of rebound and counter flex given the bamboo nature of that rod. Gonna come forward and about right there was my stop. And I'm gonna pause for a little bit and just like you said, Jonathan, now 
I'm following that fly line down. I'm not pulling it down. I'm, I, I'm following it right down evenly. And you know what? When I can do that, how does my line land, Jonathan? It'll land fly first. Fly first. It'll also land straight. And it also will land like, very technical terms, uncooked spaghetti. Okay? Yeah, right. <laughs> Versus cooked spaghetti. And more times than not, we want it to land like uncooked spaghetti. So I'm going to clear that. Think with that. Um, we're good. Anything else you want to add around that? It's pretty much the pick up and lay down. I, I, what I will add is, again, all of your cast, and I'll get out of my screen mode, unless you think we need to look at that video again, I'll get back to my camera view. Cool. I'm back in with you, Jonathan. Yes. Great. You know, so as I always like to quote you, is this is the cast to master because every single other cast that you're going to do, whether that be a false casting, which is really a series of pick up and lay downs that you're putting together, whether that be a double haul, whether that be a roll cast, or maybe it's some of those aerial men's that we love to do. Right? The wiggle men, the reach men, everything depends upon your ability to do the pick up and lay down cast. Okay. I do see a question out there, Jonathan. Shall we grab yeah, it? Yeah, I'm, um, I'm going to answer one of them uh, by typing. And then one Mary M asks about the backstop looks slightly longer than the front stop. The front stop is only about one second before the drop. Is that correct? Is, is that what she's seeing? Yeah, that's probably true because I'm making a presentation cast. If that front cast would have been a false cast, it would have been the same length of time as my back cast, right? Because the length of your pause, right, when you do a false cast, whether that be on your back or your forward cast, is a function of how much line you have past your rod tip. Now in that presentation cast, I'm gonna start lowering that rod pretty much as soon as I see that loop form is uh, my technique on how I do that, so. Okay, and then uh, Kevin, uh, must be a techie, wanted to know what software we are using, and I believe you were just using Huddle. Is that right, Marianne? Yeah, I'm using Huddle technique uh, when I, um, the videos, when I did the slow-mo and the, um, annotation that is, I like to call the John Madden drawing on the screen. And I am using um, something called a video capture device to be able to show that in regular speed. Um, it doesn't work to share a uh, video very well um, via Zoom webinars or meetings. Okay. Okay. And someone else wants to know, does it matter if your left and right foot is forward? Oh. Well, of course it does. I tend to, that's a good, I'm going to, you know what, Jonathan, I think I'll step back a little bit for a second. And why don't we talk stance and then we'll move on. Right. Um, but stance. Oh, that means I got to show my feet and I don't have shoes on. Okay. So I'm just going to talk about it because I can't get far enough away. I wasn't prepared for that. But if you will, I like to, when I cast, I like to stand with my casting leg back and my non-casting leg forward. I don't Which know if you know. Which is your casting leg? My casting leg is the, my right leg because I'm casting with my right hand, okay? And I like to have that stance because I don't like to, I don't know if you guys notice, but I don't stare straight forward when I cast or when I fish. I wanna take a look to see what my back cast is doing. So um, the other simple answer to this is Gosh, when I'm on the river, I'm just happy to have both feet planted. So, okay. yeah, there are the, what I would say to this person is there are a number of different stances, um, and that's nice in the park on grass. But when you're on the river, you do what the river allows you to do. Most of us drop the right foot back if we are right handed, like about half a step, but some of us stand with both feet close together straight at the target. 
Um, the next question is a little bit of a follow-up to this. Um, when you drop that foot back, it's easier for you, Tony, who asked this next question, who asks, how can I tell that the back loop is formed if I can't see it? And, and by, if you will, by putting your casting leg back, as I call it, right, uh, you can see that. And, uh, and I want to just say thanks to everyone for the questions. Uh, we encourage them to come on. What I want to do, Jonathan, is, is move into that next topic we, were, yeah. we said we'd talk about, which is really about um, muscle memory, right, and practice. And I can't tell you how much I wish I would have understood this when I started casting. And then, thanks to your advice, I learned about a book called The Talent Code. And there is a whole chapter or two on what they called myelin. And um, I kind of understand it, but I'm not stupid. I'm no fool. You're the doctor, so I'm going to let you go ahead and explain a little bit about what myelin is and why it's so important to practice. And then we're going to give them some grit drills that they can use to help improve their pickup and lay down cast. Okay. So myelin is a substance that is wrapped around nerves and nerve connections in the brain. We talk about muscle memory. But muscles really don't have memory. This is where memory is in the brain and the nervous system. And we create that memory by connecting one neuron to another. And the process of practice and practicing correctly wraps myelin around that connection. And those impulses travel faster and faster. This is what allows you to get up out of your chair and walk to the next room without even thinking about walking. So whether any of us knows it or not, we all have a fly casting circuit in our brains. Part of that circuit may be great and the right moves and part of that circuit may not. So what you need to do is practice and practice specific things to replace those parts of the circuit that aren't really working properly. This is what practice is all about and it's what good practice is all about. Cool. So with that, I'm going to take a step back. I'm going to suggest that those on the webinar tonight also take a step back with me so they've got the space to do a couple of the exercises that we'll be doing. And I should say drills, not exercises. So the first thing I want you all to do is I'm going to stand sideways. I'm going to take my non-casting hand. So for me, that's my left hand. I cast with my right. For others that are left-hand casters, you'll do the reverse, but I'm going to take my left hand and gently place it on my shoulder here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to play and see which of the three joints I really want to cast with. So I fished for eight years without a really good casting lesson. And so what did I do? I did what I see a lot of anglers do on the water, all wrist casting. I kind of feel a little bit of muscle movement. How about the rest of you? And Jonathan, you should be doing this as well. Yeah, I'm answering that question. Oh, gotcha. Okay, well, I'll let you get away with that, Jonathan. Okay, the next thing would be kind of working more than just your elbow. And uh, Joan Wolf, one way to kind of do this, they talked about putting a dollar or a book. I'll just put a piece of paper there. But they would put a piece of paper and they would hold their elbow tight against their body and they would work from the forearm. Now, I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm starting to feel some more muscles doing some work. And Joan Wolf, in her greatest insight and inspiration for the rest of us, said, why am I holding this thing, forcing my elbow to be against my body? That doesn't feel all that natural. I'm going to take that away, and I'm going to work from raising and lowering my elbow. And I don't know about a bunch of you, but I feel like... I've got some more work going on in my arm. And the way I look at that is I'm now using my arm to its full potential. I was given a full arm. I should go and use that to my full potential in casting. And when you do that, you're going to make that rod bend deeper. And if that rod is bending deeper or loading more when you're fishing, who's doing the work? 
the rod. You know what that means? You're not going to tire as easily and you're going to be on the water longer so that you can do what? Catch more. So we got a couple drills that I had to go through to untrain my myelin as I now understand it, Jonathan. And I'm going to step back again. I can go in pretty close, I think. And so one thing I did was I took my hand, I placed it roughly at my waist, I stared at my left hand, placed my right elbow on it, my casting arm, and I raised my elbow up, and I raised my elbow down. That's much slower than the casting motion, but that was training me to start my acceleration from my shoulder. So elbow up, elbow down, elbow up, elbow down. You can practice that anywhere in your home. I encourage you to do that. The taking that same drill, um, but leading into solving another problem, which we're also going to work on fixing, is remember I talked about a lot of wrists? This is a great little tool. It's called the wedge. It's called the Walter wedge because Jonathan Walter came up with it. You've got such great insights on great tools, Jonathan. And how much are we selling this uh, wedge for on your website? Oh, oh, it's if you have to ask, you know. <laughs> oh, you got to ask for the price, right? Yeah, a special, to ask, you a special it. tonight, $49.99, <laughs> right? So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take that wedge. I'm going to put it between just underneath my wrist, right, and right with my rod butt. And I'm going to do that same exercise. Elbow up, elbow down. Elbow up, elbow down. Now what this Walter wedge is requiring me to do is to keep my wrist firm as I accelerate. If I don't keep my wrist firm, if I do what a lot of us want to do is open up our wrist on the back cast, what's going to happen? Our wedge is going to fall out and we're going to have to stop, pick it up and start all over. So really good, good, good drill. And that's a good drill for that acceleration move. The next step is going to be what? It's an accelerate to a stop. And I did ask all of you to bring a peanut butter knife or a classic dinner knife because this is really important. And I made this mistake too when I first started. But I made the mistake of doing what? Death gripping that rod as I accelerate. Okay? And if I had a knife in my hand, right, it's not going to cut me, but it's going to hurt. And I had someone once tell me, you know, think about when you're accelerating, Marianne, that you have a bird in your hand and hold that bird really softly. We would hold that bird very softly. So I have a Tweety bird I practice with. Okay? And so when I'm accelerating, and I love how I got some blue on my hand, but what else is new for Marianne, is when I'm accelerating, I mean, I'm gonna come up real close. When I'm accelerating, am I squeezing Tweety? No, I've got Tweety nice and loose. But when I come into my stop, what am I going to do? I'm literally going to pull, re re remember this, I'm going to pull on Tweety's feet by starting with my pinky and moving into my ring finger. Okay? I'm going to pull Tweety's feet into my stop. What's that do? That makes that rod go from its loaded or bent position faster to its natural state, straight position, and that's going to give me more line speed. Okay? So here we go. Let's practice that stop. Okay, I'm going to go into it. Pinky goes, ring finger goes, and the others follow. Okay. And what's key is I did not push Tweety's head. I did not push Tweety's head as I was accelerating. I did not push Tweety's head at the stop. Some other time you all get the opportunity to see a presentation that Dave and I have with regards to effective loading and unloading the rod. We can show that much better with bamboo. And you will see it's amazing how much, if you will, energy you lose by pushing as you stop that rod. Okay. Mary Ann, there's a, there's a question. I'll, uh -huh. I'll throw it out now. Do you use different grips for different, um, uh, different casts? Like, yes, I do. Different for distance versus accuracy, et cetera. Yeah. So uh, my recommendation for 
80% of anyone's fishing that's going for trout is to do the classic Joan Wolf thumb on top. Okay. If I'm going to go distance, okay, and going distance is another webinar, I'm going to do what some people call the V grip. Okay. What I don't want to do is what? The good old the gripping of it. Jonathan, do you have another yeah, grip cool. you like? But those two are my kind of go-to grips, thumb on top or the, the V grip. Yeah, I, I, there's a variation of the V grip that I use most of the time. Um, I tend to use thumb, you know, I'm, I'm, I do it a little different than you. And this is the thing about this is you'll find a grip that works best for you for yeah. whatever situation. I tend to use thumb on top for distance. And I use my I use my variation of V grip for most everything else. So, but you know, so this gets into style and personal preference. So, Jim, I hope that answered your question as best we can uh, in in this space. I, and I've just got to make a comment on one of the chats, uh, Connie. No, I don't fish uh, barefooted, so you got me on that one. So that's pretty good. I appreciate that one. So where are we going to go to next? Ah, we're going to go to our last drill. We're going to go to a drill I learned from Dave Barron. I hope some of you brought your pens that I suggested. I've got a couple here to demonstrate this a couple times because if I do this right, I'm going to lose my pen cap. What you want to do, and these are all great. These drills are stuff you can do at home, right? You know, when you're doing the dishes or whatever, or just watching TV, you'll notice I have my pen cap a bit loose. Okay, and I'm going to, and I'll rotate around. I'm going to, I'm going to integrate that accelerate to the stop drill. And if I accelerate to a stop and I'm kind of weak, like you just saw there, my pen cap doesn't fly off. But if I accelerate to a Chris stop or to that pull Tweety's feet stop, watch what happens to the pen cap. Flew off. Yes, this is where you hope with this drill that you've trained your little dog to retrieve your pen cap. I'm going to try to do it one more time and I'll try to do it a bit slower and a bit closer. So again, you'll notice I'm going to be dropping my show, my elbow from my shoulder as I'm accelerating. And at that stop, I'm going to pull my pinky and my ring finger in and that should get my pen cap to fly off if I've done a good acceleration to a crisp stop. And there we go. Can we move on from a time point of view, yes. Jonathan? Yes. Okay. Um, so we've talked those three drills. That's pretty cool. Right? We've talked about the acceleration to load the rod as deep as you can. We've talked about the stop to unload it as quick as you can. Now we need to talk about what? We need to talk about loop control. And loop control is the size of your loop and if you recall, earlier I drew that, it's the size and shape your loop takes during your pause. Okay? And this is what we're going to call a narrow loop. I always get this mirror confused. So this is a narrow loop. In real life, it's about, what, four inches okay, right now. But when I'm casting, if I can get a two to four foot loop, I'm thinking I've got a pretty nice narrow loop. There are times when I want to call, throw a wide loop, right? This is about six to eight inches in real life. Um, when I'm fishing, it's about six to eight foot for a, uh, um, uh, a distance between the bottom leg of the loop and the top leg. And as you said, Jonathan, so well, it's not so much about one loop is better than the other. It's about the angler having the ability to control that size of the loop. So with that, uh, any questions on that? Otherwise, I'm going to do, well, I do want to show this and talk a little bit about this. The other way to look at it is, is a narrow loop should always fit inside of a wide loop. And an easy way to think about it is this narrow loop is like throwing a tennis ball. What's that tennis ball going to get you? Distance and accuracy. This wide loop is like throwing a beach ball. 
Okay, lots of fun because you can bounce it back and forth, but you're not going to get a lot of accuracy or a lot of distance with it, which is okay because there's a fishing situation where you want a wide loop. So let's talk about those two fishing scenarios. So one, we're on a spring creek. We just happened to hit the heyday, right? Or the mother load. And we've got a really nice BWO hatch coming off. Right? It's crystal clear water. I'm not gonna be able to stand five foot or 10 foot from the fish. I'm gonna have to stand away from the fish, a distance 20, maybe even 40 foot. And I'm gonna have to deliver my fly to pretty small spot, right? Because I got to hit that feeding lane that that fish is fishing in. Am I going to throw a tennis ball or a beach ball? Another way to say it is, do I want to cast a narrow loop or do I want to cast a wide loop? I'm going to want to cast what? I'm going to want to cast a narrow loop. I'm going to want to throw a tennis ball, okay? So a good rule of thumb whenever you're dry fly fishing, think about the ability to throw a nice narrow loop, less than four foot. Now my next scenario is gonna be what many of us on the West have just experienced, is the stonefly, salmon fly, golden stonefly hatch that happens in the springtime. And it's before that hatch, they haven't come out yet. All the stoneflies are congregating and headed towards shore so that they can come to the, if you will, they can climb out of the river. So what are we going to be fishing? We're going to be fishing what? A big old indicator. And we're probably going to be fishing two big old stoneflies like this. Yeah. Are we going to want to be throwing a tight loop with that or a big loop? Well, I don't need to throw a tight loop because since I'm subsurface fishing, I can get closer to the fish and the accuracy isn't as important. And most importantly, if I tried to throw, as I like to say, this hunk of junk with a tight loop, as my line is unrolling, gravity is probably going to take that top leg of my loop and cause it to collapse on the other one. So there's an example where you want to be able to throw a wide loop. Narrow loop, dry fly fishing. Wide loop, indicator fishing. So I'm going to go ahead, Jonathan, and I think there might be a question or two or a comment or two. And yeah. um, I'm going to go ahead and switch over to my other device. So just in case I run into a little switching right. problem, I'll let you fill the space again. Yeah. So Jim had a question about how do you get the loop to form a wedge or that arrowhead type point, as he put it. Um, mm. So do you, do you want you me know, to take that I, or you, Marianne? I, 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 guess what? I'll try it and then you give your answer because sometimes a different instructor gives a different answer that teaches to the student, right? So for me, when you want that wedge, um, Jim, and I, I'm, I'm assuming when you're talking about that wedge, you're talking more about, oh, I can't show that here. I'm going to get out of my, uh, go back to my screen here. I'm back to my camera front. You're kind of talking about, if you will, your loop being nice and almost like a V rather than a rounded U, okay? And that is always the quality of your stop. So the crisper you can stop your rod, okay? The shorter distance you stop your rod in, if you will, the more your loop is gonna look like a V versus your loop looking like a U. So Jim, did that answer your question out there? And would you, uh, Jonathan, how would you have taken that approach if a student asked you that question as I switch to my uh, iPad here? Absolutely agree. That's all about the crisp, complete stop. Yep. Cool. Yeah. Okay. So now I'm back to my video analysis. I'm a happy camper. And I got to make sure, do I have full control of the screen here? I do look like I'm... Um, uh, the iPad is taking up the entire screen. So I'm going to play this again. And this is, a, if you will, I'm back to my green screen. So with a little bit of luck, it enables you to see my fly rod and my loop. And I'll play that at normal speed. And see if you can notice those loop shapes. Oh, there's a nice tight one. Nice tight loop. Ooh, a little bit wider. A little bit wider. 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 And there we go. Sometimes that's hard for those of us to know what the sizes were based upon the fact that I at least knew what I was casting correct. 
So I'm going to go at half speed again and show you the value of slow mo. There we go. Be great to get a thumbs up from a few people if they can see the 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 loop shape. And we're going to do that one more time. And I want you to notice. Do you see the difference where I'm stopping my rod for a narrow loop or a wide loop? And I know I could get really geeky on all this geometry, but you know, when your hands are on the oars and your angler is dry fly fishing from a moving boat, they really want a simple command. And it's gonna be, stop your rod tip higher for a narrow loop. Stop it higher for a narrow loop. I'm gonna pause and stop it lower for a, for a wide loop. I'm gonna go back and annotate that because we can. So I'm going to pick yellow. We'll use yellow. I get to pick the colors this time, Jonathan. And so if you will, okay. about right in here, you can see my rod bending again. And when it goes straight, that's roughly my stop. Probably good enough for what we're trying to show tonight in terms of the stop. And I've stopped my rod, oh, let's say about right there. That's pretty high. That's above my head. And let's watch that. Of course, the bamboo likes to do a little counter flex and rebound. We'll draw that loop shape. Okay, it's pretty tight. I'll go backwards for a second. So pretty nice tight loop. Let's watch a couple of those. Here comes another loop. Here we go. Rod straight about a little bit there. Oh, I'm ahead of myself, aren't I? So let's go back. <laughs> me would you ever believe me getting ahead of myself right there we go there's a nice high stop tight loop nice high stop tight loop okay and now let's watch this next one you'll notice oh i didn't stop until about right there did i all right that's probably roughly my stop we'll choose a different color we'll go with blue so I've stopped my rod tip a little lower. And what did that result in? A wider loop. Again, nothing wrong with a wide loop, is there, Jonathan? Nope. If, the as challenge, long as that's what you want. As long as that's what you want. The challenge is all of us are really good at throwing wide loops. The challenge is learning to throw a tight loop by stopping that rod tip higher, which um, you think I should jump into arc. Now we'll continue. Yeah. That can continue yeah. another day. I'm watching time. The challenge is to be able to throw and control whether you're going to cast a tight loop or you're going to cast a narrow loop. Again, it's all about your fishing situation. I'm going to clear that. Are there any questions out there, Jonathan? Let's see. No, there are not right now. Oh, OK. Anything fun in chat? <laughs> um, there are kudos, so cool. that's good. Oh, that's good. That's good. Nice to hear that. Cool, yeah. I hope people are getting excited about the video analysis. I mean, this is a video analysis is part of the breakthrough for us really promoting the art of fly casting. So the next piece is going to be, oh, you're so proud of yourself. You've learned to control whether you can throw a tight loop or a wide loop. You've learned to be able to stop where you need for a dry fly cast and where you need to stop for, a, uh, if you will, casting with an indicator and nymphs. I'm going to hit play again on this one. And I'm not going to say anything about what's happening. And we'll just let people, I got to get to the right speed. We'll just let people watch and see if they observe what's happening. Ooh, let's do that again. And I'm going to go slower mode. I'm going to go half speed again. A nice tight loop. So clearly I'm thinking I'm dry fly fishing. Nice tight loop. And my presentation cast, what did I do? You went through your stop sign. I rolled through my stop sign. And I've really, you know, there's a, a, one of the things I've learned as a guide even more so than a cast instructor, is, is people confuse the stop with the pause. So that stop is different than the pause. The stop is when your hand sees movement, and the pause is why you wait for that line to unroll. And then in the case of this, if you will, a tight loop presentation, people think about, well, I'm just going to roll through the stop sign. And what happens? 
they lost their beautiful accuracy and distance by throwing a wide loop. And I will bet money that that line right there landed like cooked spaghetti and off on accuracy. What I should have done, we'll go back. What I should have done on that presentation cast is, well, we'll go back even further. I like being able to ad lib here. So that roughly is my stop on my presentation, cat, my false cast, isn't it? Uh, we'll go to green, see if we can see green on the green screen. And you can see what's happening. Nice tight loops forming off of that. Okay. Gonna come through another one. Is this a false cast or is this my presentation? There we go. Notice there's no stop there. I really don't stop till the bottom. And what did that result into? We gotta change the color on that, right? because we weren't looking for a wide loop on presentation, I was looking for a tie loop, resulted in a wide loop. So the next progression, you can control your loop size, then you've gotta be really good about not rolling through the stop sign and stopping your presentation cast high like you stopped your false cast. Okay, are there a few questions otherwise? Yeah, there, there are, so Molly would like you to comment on how do you stop how does one stop breaking the wrist on the back cast? Oh, practice. The strategy for that. Right, yep, yep, yep. So uh, Molly, thank you, that's a great question and thank you for joining in. I, I really appreciate all the partnering we do and all the mentoring I've gotten for you. Um, if you'll remember Jonathan's wedge, I think one of the past uh, best drills, I gotta find your wedge, oh, here it is. <laughs> okay, one of the best drills to practice on not, if you will, opening up that wrist on your back is to work with this wedge, do that. Another simple thing that we say, and Molly knows this because she's a guide as well, is we say, keep an eye on that thumb, right? Because you can't necessarily be casting with a wedge when you're fishing, Jonathan, sorry about that. Right? but I got to take your wedge away. And I'm going to think about when I stop, I always want my thumb to be pointing up. I'll get in closer. Notice when I stop, my thumb is pointing upwards. I never want to think about that, that thumb pointing horizontally. I think about it pointing completely vertical. That's going to help me stop breaking my wrist. Another line we like to use is what? Fly casting isn't about hitchhiking. And when you stop on the back and you're hitchhiking, you've dropped the rod tip too far and you're gonna get a wide loop on the back. Yeah, and I, I'll just comment that- do you, um, Yeah, do you have any tricks I, you I, use? I, well, I, I do use the wedge um, and um, I have uh, a protocol uh, that I have students use for practice with the wedge that helps them uh, get the so-called muscle memory so that they stop breaking the wrist on the back cast. Um, that seems to be fairly successful. Right, okay. Um, so the, um, I'm, Go ahead, we've got I'm noticing a, a, a question from um, BR. Can you speak more to how line weight and rod action affect the casting loop? Wow, that's a big question there. Um, what I am gonna say is for, if you will, we always talk about it. You got to match your arc to the amount of bend in your rod. Clearly, a stiffer rod is going to bend less than a softer rod. So if I want to get a narrow loop with a faster rod, I can still stop high. But because a softer rod is going to bend more, I'm going to need to change and stop lower to get that same size loop. Again, the simplest way us casters talk about it is got to match, if you will, the art to the bend in your rod. And Shirley wants to buy a wedge. And if that's my buddy, Shirley, <laughs> I'm happy to mail one to her. So. Yeah, cool. they're not hard cool. to make, guys. Right. Um, on, uh, somebody asked about what's the protocol. And uh, I, I can, in the, for the sake of time, I won't go through it in detail, but we'll say that um, anybody who wants that protocol, just contact me and I'll send it to you. Um, certainly not a secret and I'm willing to share. Right, yeah, cool. 
So I think we're going to go ahead and uh, move into a, a bit of a, a into a wrap up. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, and I also want to make sure, well, I'm going to share my screen so it doesn't matter. So here we go. Give me a second to get into uh, slideshow mode since it's kind of hard to see. So again, thank you all for joining in. I think we're in screen show mode now. I'm going to minimize something on my screen. So Juan, thank you. We've covered a lot of information. Hopefully, you're going to wake up tomorrow and say, I've got to master that pickup and lay down cats. And hopefully, you're going to say, man, I learned about muscle memory and more appropriately myelin, and that I've got to learn to come up with drills to isolate key aspects of my cast and to do those drills slowly. And most importantly, I hope the rest of the evening is spent at least 15 minutes by all of you working on the three drills we taught you to do that rewiring. Dropping and raising that elbow, what's that gonna do? If you can do that as you accelerate, working from that shoulder, you're gonna get a deeper bend in your rod. I hope you all had fun with my mad Tweety, uh, but I like to call it the mad pull stop, right? Where I'm pulling on Tweety's toes as I come into my stop. And then I gotta give credit to Dave Barron. What a simple little casting drill you can do with flipping the pen cap. We also talked about getting the correct loop size or loop control as you like to use, Jonathan, for how I'm fishing, right? Dry fly, I probably want that narrow loop indicator going to be thinking about being able to cast a wide loop and um, I hope a few of you got as excited and obsessed as I am about the video analysis with the slow-mo and the annotation. So if you're motivated to go and prove your cast to catch more I'm going to make a simple suggestion go out onto your internet search engine do a search for Fly Fishers International Learning Center what should pop up is an option to go to the casting area. I'm gonna use my cursor to point that out. And in that casting area, you're gonna see an opportunity for casting instruction. That's where I suggest you go first. You're gonna see some videos and supporting documentation on how to do that pick up and lay down cast, how to false cast, how to roll cast. And thanks to Molly for all of that content in there. And thanks to Molly and Jonathan also, and Bill and Rick for the work that they did. And I should say Molly Semenik and Jonathan and Bill Wheeler and Rick Williams for the work they did on the skills challenge. This is a challenge for you, only you, not a competition with anyone else. You can get a bronze, silver, or gold, and all of the challenges are designed around fishing casts. Great little mechanism for you to have a way to measure your casting improvement. And for those of you that are out teaching, there's actually a teaching package to help enable you to teach casting to others. Next up, if you're someone who wants to have a face-to-face -face resource, as Jonathan and I have mentioned more than once, we're not the only two fly fishing instructors in the world, um, but there is over 1,400 of us that are casting instructors. And the way to find one of those for your face-to-face -face resources would be to do a search for find a certified casting instructor. In that search, as you can see, I know it's kind of small, but you're going to be able to select by search by country, but by state or city. Again, there's 1,400 of us worldwide. And if you happen to remember the first few characters of someone's name that you want to follow up with specifically, you can do that search there. Now, I'm going to have, I'm going to admit this next slide is a bit of shameless marketing. <laughs> um, but, you know, sometimes we've just got to do that. Um, as you've heard me say many times, I'm obsessed with the video casting analysis and how I think it can really accelerate someone improving their fly casting. But we can couple that now with a Zoom meeting, okay? So we're paving some new road around linking, if you will, all of this casting analysis with remote meetings over Zoom. But there's a few of us, Molly, Semenik, Jonathan Walter, and myself. If 
you're interested in getting some remote casting instruction, I'll leave this slide up for a few minutes, get a picture of it, do a search for us on your search engine, and uh, I'm sure we'd be happy to work with you uh, for a price, of course, on the remote casting instruction. So with that, I'm going to wrap up, Jonathan. Do we have any? A, yeah, we've got a yeah. couple questions to, to cover. Cool. Um, the first is from Jill Clark uh -huh. asking about, is answer the phone a good verbal clue? Yes, it is. And, and um, I'll stop sharing. I, I remember doing that one early, early on. You too, Jonathan, correct? Oh, yeah. Uh, um, I, do you have a land phone with you? I don't. I have this. We'll just pretend. If what? Remember, it's a. Ah. I have this. We'll just so pretend. If you remember, go for remember it, Jonathan. You got a real phone. phone. Show show how that works. So if you remember the old. Go wall sideways phone, so people can us. see it. Okay. You can't hear you, Jonathan. You can't hear me, Jonathan. We've lost mute. your audio. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, we lost your audio. So I'll jump in. So if this is my phone, and what Jill is a great idea, Jill. Right. My rod tip is low. I'm gonna answer the phone. There's my accelerate to the stop, okay? And sometimes we say hello, right? And goodbye, right? So if you will, the back cast is answer the phone. The forward cast is goodbye, put the phone down. Hopefully we didn't lose my audio as well. Are you back no, on your audio, I could, Jonathan? I, I could hear you. Okay, and I, I can hear you now. Okay, Other questions? So, yes, the next question is, when does the tightening of the little finger happen in the forward part of the cast? After the acceleration? As, uh, yeah, yeah. As you, uh, as you make that transition from your acceleration to the stop, right? So after the acceleration. I don't think about starting to rotate, if you will, back to Tweety. I love my little Tweety, okay? I'm accelerating, accelerating. Now I got to stop. That's when I think about pulling on Tweety's feet. And that's my stop. Okay. Would you have answered that? How would you have answered that, Jonathan, or in a different way that might make no, more sense very, to them? Very similar. Very okay. similar. Yep. Okay. Yep. Cool. Yep. And let's see. That's really, that's really about it, I believe, on questions. Okay. Cool. Um, and I see some yeah. kind of comments, so I appreciate that, as my mom would say. Glad we did a great presentation here, Jonathan. That's what we always strive for. And, uh, you know, it's a special night. I don't know. I can't see all of the attendees, but there's a chance that uh, one of my great nephews is on board tonight, and it's his seventh birthday. So would you join in with me, Jonathan, before we sign off? And and saying happy birthday to, to Henry. Okay. Happy birthday, Henry. Happy We're not birthday, gonna sing. Henry. We're not gonna sing a song for you, Henry. Jonathan no, is but... very well pleased with that one. No, no song, <laughs> <laughs> no song, no Jeffrey, we're not singing the song. <laughs> no, we're not singing the song. But Jeffrey, do you want us to bring you in as a panelist? And you could do that as well. Yeah, you could sing it solo. Yeah, you could sing it Would you solo. Like that? Cool. So I'm going to back to sharing my last screen because I, I love this. Uh, I love this so much. So again, I'll share if you're interested in face-to-face -face casting instructions, check out the FFI website. If you're not having the fortunate of doing face-to-face, -face, Molly, Semenik, Jonathan, and I are just working on paving the road for everyone to be able to do remote casting instruction. And as some of you know, I'm Dutch. So I'm going to say thank you, Jonathan, for being my moderator tonight. Welcome. Also, thank you for all of us, uh, all of you that have joined in. And the Dutch have a, a way of saying goodbye. They don't say goodbye. They say tootsins, till we meet you again. Thanks again. Really appreciate all the support tonight. Thanks, everybody. Stop share. And then before I end this, I think we've got a couple more questions. I'll take a look at that. Oh, we had someone from Nova Scotia. So anyway, 
Cool. Well, Jonathan, I think we've got a wrap. Again, thank you so much. And thank you, everybody who joined in. Yep. Bye. Great. Bye-bye.